Good evening. So you are very welcome to this week's 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum of Dublin. Now this evening we are going to be speaking with our Dublin, the European, a European capital city head on. Um, and our guest this evening is Audrey Hogan, the Programme Officer within the Europa Nostra European Heritage Awards. Audrey, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. I was uh, just enjoying there. I thought that the intro was especially uh, suitable for tonight's theme with uh, this European heritage. It's beautiful to see it. Oh, well, thank you. And it was lovely to kind of get a little sense of the uh, Santa Rita heritage. Um, so yeah. to everyone who is with us, if you've got questions as we go through the evening, please do type them in for Audrey and we will get through them. Um, but Audrey, just to kind of set the scene, could I ask you just to introduce me to the Europa Nostra and kind of tell me where it sits in the wider European Union, European Commission structure? Yeah, of course. So um, Europa Nostra is a it's a non-governmental organization, but of course we have uh, very close ties with, uh, with the European institutions and, um, and the Council of Europe. Um, we call ourselves the, the voice of civil society committed to cultural heritage. So what we really want to do is we want to be the, the, the people who speak on behalf of civil society and the, the people who are working for heritage every day um, on, on the grassroots level up until the, the institutions. And we try to, to lobby also for heritage at that um, European level. Um, and then where I come into it is we have a, a number of programs and uh, one of those programs is the European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards. So the Europa Nostra Awards um, have actually been in existence for uh, quite a long time now, since the 1970s. Um, but since 2002, um, the European Commission in that year, they launched the EU Prize for Cultural Heritage. And since then, we have worked with the European Commission, and that's why it has this, this slightly longer name uh, of the European Heritage Awards slash uh, uh, European Austria Awards. Um, and so we're working with the European Commission on this program to really present the, the best practices in cultural heritage. Um, from across Europe, um, we have a wide understanding, so it's not just working with the EU uh, countries, but also with the wider um, understanding of Europe, on, let's say, geographically. So we have, I think, there are 50 or, 50 or so countries which are eligible to, to enter our award scheme. Um, and then we have um, up to 30 winners every year that we um, promote on EU level and we also use them as sort of best practice examples so um, but Europe and Austria that's not all they do of course and um, so we also have the seven most endangered scheme which is let's say it's going from best practices to heritage that's maybe in need of some help so um, every year now we are uh, with the European Investment Bank Institute we are um, uh, listing seven, shortlisting first and then listing seven sites in Europe which are in need of some extra care, let's say. And actually, I, I was um, I, I was really fascinated reading about the kind of the advocacy work ultimately that um, you as an organization are doing on kind of behalf of and kind of amplifying the, the need for the awareness of kind of working towards protecting endangered heritage sites. But I, I would like to talk about that, but just to come back to the awards for a second, um, like how we met the Europa Nostra is that we had the very good fortune of um, being a recipient a number of years ago. Yeah. And I think just it, it, as a scheme, it looks to contribute to this kind of stronger public recognition of cultural heritage and kind of, I guess, my how I, how I understand it is looking to actually showcase on a European level, how impactful and valuable our cultural heritage is to society and the economy around us. Um, I, could you tell me a little bit about how the awards are focused, like what categories, like wh what are you kind of recognizing ultimately? Yeah, exactly. So um, I suppose that we can say that the issue with heritage is that it's so broad. I mean, it's you can talk about built heritage and I think 
sometimes this is the understanding that people have that cultural heritage is referring to to castles and to palaces and things like this but actually it's it's affecting so much of our of our lives so it's also um uh, yeah intangible heritage it's also research into heritage and what we are also showing is that um cultural heritage has a relevance to as you say every aspect of our lives so um, there is also plenty of evidence to show that cultural heritage can be a driver for innovation it's um i think well recorded that it's a it's a driver of international relations and diplomacy so this is really what we are trying to to highlight with the award scheme so we do have four categories of entry because at some point you have to try and organize things a little bit so uh, we have conservation research and then uh, we have dedicated service which is more focused on the people behind these projects and for uh, long uh, periods of dedicated uh, service to heritage and then we have education training and awareness raising which is of course the category that uh, the Little Museum of Dublin was uh, awarded in um, and so once we have our winners in those categories, then we also try and uh, communicate about each of them in a kind of very tailored way to sort of to show why they are important and why they are a best practice example. So the other important thing to remember about the awards is that though we have a new set of winners every year, it's really you know the archive is being used all of the time as this sort of um, well, first of all, it's a it's a bank of best practice examples, which is always very good. I mean, if you want to prove your point, you just you it's the best thing you can do is illustrate it with the very concrete examples of how it works and why it's relevant. Um, but it's also really an archive. It's it's been going on for so long now that it's actually this record of trends in heritage and and how our attitudes have changed and what is important i mean the education training and awareness raising category didn't even exist until i think 2008 and when you think of that it's so strange because it seems obvious to us now i think so but it's it, as you said though it is interesting because it kind of shows how we i guess as um, as a collective kind of wider community are evolving over time and how our own kind of, I guess, awareness of what is important to preserve and protect and also how to kind yeah. of record it as well as to do so in the activities that we run. Um, and just a term that you used there a moment ago, just to kind of mm -hmm. explain the scope of kind of the work that, or I guess, the kind of the projects that would fall under the category of heritage. When you talk about tangible and intangible, could you just mm -hmm. explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so tangible, as I said, um, it can refer to like castles and, and uh, this built heritage or um, buildings like uh, the Little Museum of Dublin and and this this type of anything that you can hold and also collections of um, objects when you go into a museum, this is your, your tangible um, heritage and it's also referring to um, things like natural heritage, which again is another thing that it's difficult to define these things because uh, lots of people have um, sort of, uh, yeah, not everyone meets at the same point when we want to define these things, but so it can also refer to this uh, uh, natural heritage or cultural landscapes. Um, and then the intangible is really, it's um, it's more linked to, to people, it's what you can't hold in your hand. So it's more so referring to um, yeah, traditions like music, dancing, um, it can also be costumes, it can be wedding rituals all over the world, it can be, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so it's sport as well. I know that um, there's a, the UNESCO website for the intangible heritage is really, really fascinating. And there's a really, really nice graphic if you ever want to learn about intangible heritage, where you can click on all of these things and see how these things are linked. Um, and Ireland, I think, has two, two uh, intangible heritage uh, um, listed on the, the UNESCO um, list now. And I think it's Illin piping and uh, hurling. So these are considered very, um, yeah, like uh, important to Ireland and to, to Irish heritage. So 
yeah, this is what we're doing. And, and you know, in each of the, the so with the awards, we, we tend in these uh, categories to think a little bit of the, the tangible when we're thinking about these things. But of course, what we have seen as well is that if you have a tangible, if you have a, a heritage site and somewhere where you can visit, there is an intangible heritage inherently there. You can't uh, avoid it. And it's something which is when you're preserving that, you're also preserving the intangible heritage. And I, yeah. <laughs> kind of, it, it's funny because one thing that I always, or not that I always find, but one thing I sometimes find when we're having conversations about heritage or culture is sometimes the terminology can be kind of it can be intimidating when ultimately we're talking about the things that we all collectively do on a day-to-day -day basis and are really yeah. the, the foundations of so many of the rituals and the I guess the societies that we operate within um, and just kind of I guess like we had um, Geraldine Walsh an absolutely wonderful woman who's yeah. uh, Dublin Civic Trust and obviously 18 Ormond Quay, yeah. uh, which we spoke about on this series only recently, was one of your winners this year. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I, I remember when you and I caught up earlier this week, um, you were talking about that project and you you mentioned that it was so relevant from an EU perspective. Um, like, could you just tell me a little bit about that project in the context of it winning a Europe and Austria? Yeah, so um, this is yeah, it's a it's a wonderful project. It's really it's so special, and I think um, to people in Dublin, maybe it's it's obvious that it has this significance because it's a it's sort of unfortunately a little bit rare. I mean, and and it and it shows what can be done. There are so many of these buildings in in Dublin, and uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if they were all. Uh, you know, restored like that and put to good use, and um, it really adds so much to to the to the street itself and to the the typology of the city. It, it adds so much. Um, so yes, on an EU level, well, what was interesting was that um, so when the jury were looking at that and what they they sort of picked up on it was that it was. Being, it, it was chosen to be purposefully a demonstration. So it's almost like the, and I hope that they will agree when I'm saying this, but that the Dublin Civic Trust decided that this was going to be, they wanted to show what could be done and they wanted to show that it's possible. And this is what the, the jury really picked up on. Uh, this. So we have a jury of experts for each of the, the categories and um, they're coming from all over Europe. So they have this very, wide understanding they're coming from lots of different disciplines as well and this is what they they picked up on um, and also the the funding model the fact that it's they used a revolving fund um, and they also had lots of different income sources so again while in Ireland maybe it's a little bit obvious and it's a it's it's or not obvious but um it's it's recognizable and it you know we we've maybe understood this happening before but on a European level that's not really the case and so the important thing about the the awards and what we're trying to achieve with it is that you're trying to take these local examples and showing what worked in one country and trying to kind of export them a little bit or show them as examples to to other countries who are facing similar issues and the thing in Europe is that yeah, we are all facing the, the same issues. So, you know, it, it, you know, Ireland is comparable to plenty of other EU countries facing similar issues. So when you look at a successful project in Romania, you can see like, yeah, this would definitely work in Ireland. I mean, there are people who love uh, heritage in Ireland too. I'm sure that this would work. So this is also what we're really trying to achieve. And and um, sometimes they can feel like very local projects and very specific to the area, but actually they're very transferable. So I think this was also something with the Little Museum of Dublin. I remember what they liked so much about your approach is that it's it's very it really resonates with people from Dublin. I think <clears throat> this idea of storytelling and um objects and and deciding yourself what is uh, relevant to you and also you know in a sense 
it's very focused on the 20th century, which is this very important time for Ireland. It's also your sort of, there's a little bit of soul searching and also figuring ourselves out and, you know, and the fact that people could decide themselves what they wanted to put in that museum. So it seems very local and very Dublin is, in a sense, but it can be very European as well, and it can be relevant to anybody, and maybe it wouldn't occur to somebody in another country, but it could, so <laughs> this but, is... No, I, 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 it's, it's lovely to kind of get a sense, and it's funny kind of thinking back that it was, I think it was nearly, gosh, approaching five years ago that we had that honour, and it yeah. was an amazing yeah. experience for us, um, but I do, I, I, I completely agree that kind of you know, as caretakers and kind of keepers of important buildings, being able to see the work that people like Geraldine are doing. But then also, as you said, you know, if we're looking at ideas and when we're kind of visualizing what can be and what the future of the museum lo looks like, potentially it's it's talking to people that you meet in and around the building, but it's also looking at best practice across Europe and further afield. And so it is kind of the importance of sharing that knowledge. It's really quite yeah it's it's vital really um but then kind of like you mentioned the dedication of service um mm -hmm. board category and a uh, a little bit of time on google shows me that we had an irish man who won that award only yeah. a few years ago you might tell us about him yeah yeah this is uh so uh jim calorie so um he is well was the owner of uh, strokestown house in County Roscommon and I think it's in oh I hope I don't get it wrong in 2017 or 2018 <laughs> maybe maybe you know it so. <laughs> yeah um but yeah he he won and uh, in the dedicated service category and what was so special about him was that um yeah it was it was really you know the the way the the story goes it's almost by accident that he when he bought this place, he, he found these old documents and he was so moved by uh, what he read. And, you know, it's, it's sorry, I should say as well, it's now the National Famine Museum um, and they're, they're doing wonderful work sort of, um, yeah, telling the stories of the, the people who lived on that estate and, and uh, or the, the tenants of that estate and, and what, they, what they endured and what they went through. It's, it's, a, it's a very sad story. Um, but yeah, his dedication was recognized by the jury. It was considered to be something very special. And so I think I told you earlier in the week as well that it's really one of my nicest memories of working on the awards because um, we each year have a kind of a day long conference um, for the award winners to share their experiences and to to on a European level tell us about their projects and what their challenges were and, and what they learned along the way to try and kind of share those um, experiences. And so Mr. Callery, of course, he got up and he told his story and how, how he um, acquired such a house and, and what moved him to do it. And it was really very moving. I remember when he was telling it, you could hear the emotion in his voice. And I think that this you know, for me anyway, it just told me so much of how, how important heritage is to, to us. It's really part of our identity. And um, it, again, it, it kind of creates that empathy in, in us, you know, that we can read a letter. Um, so in the letter, maybe I should say that uh, the letter that he found, it was from a tenant to the, to the, the landlord asking for some lenience and, um, in the end, he discovered that the, the family were actually evicted and it was quite sad and they're talking about how they were they were starving and um, it was a difficult story to hear. But yeah, I think that to know that this empathy can can be brought about by this this type of heritage, it's it's important. And I think it it again, it shows, yeah, it shows the importance of, of heritage and why we need to to remember these things and and to to care for it as well it, it's funny I think when you say the word empathy it really makes it makes me kind of think and it's something that we've talked about in the little museum a lot over the last number of months this idea that even taking the pandemic that we're currently living through as an example when this kicked off we looked to 1918 we looked to past mm. comparable experiences to try and 
I, I don't know if it was to get a sense of what might be ahead, to get a sense of hope, to get a sense of despair, whatever the trigger the individual might have been looking to. But there is, I can imagine, a strong argument for the value of cultural heritage and kind of societal heritage to actually build community connection and actually kind of togetherness. Is there yeah. Yeah, of course, because I think um, as well uh, earlier this week, we were talking about this question of empathy and how we can create it and how when we go through a, an experience like this, we can actually then sort of, we understand what our, what our ancestors went through. And um, I think also just using that example of the, the, the National the, the Famine Museum, you know, they also told this story that um, they do a, a famine walk and it's going from Roscommon to Dublin. And um, while it, they, the last time that they did it, it was during the migrant crisis when people were also getting onto boats and they were drowning in the sea. And it's, it's, it's terrible to talk about and it's, uh, it's terrible, it's very sad, but I think that there is definitely this way of, if we connect to our, to what happened before and connected to the people who came before us and you know there's already this link because it was Irish people and we can understand that and we can imagine it happening in the areas that we grew up in but then you can all also apply it to the struggles that are happening now and you can have this empathy for people who live halfway across the world so it's yeah I think it's uh, extremely important and um we also have seen it with a number of the other award winners. I mean, it's also a very powerful way to, to make people feel like they belong in a community and also that they are empowered as well. So there's been really nice projects that have um, come to the awards and which have been awarded. And one that I can think of, for example, was um, one that was awarded last year in Hungary. And so, it was a, a project um, dealing with Roma heritage. And so Roma, of course, they're, um, I think the biggest minority in Europe. Um, and they're also so maligned, you know, they are, they are talked about it in a terrible way, I think <laughs> probably all across Europe. And this project was really amazing because um, they trained uh, young people who are Roma to take people on tours through their communities and to introduce them to Roma heritage. And um, what they have reported is that, you know, it, for uh, at one point, it, at one stage, it, you know, it changes the attitudes of the, the participants who are taking part. And, you know, they, they meet people from the community and they see that they're, they're good people too and that they have a, a very rich culture that deserves to be respected. But at the same time, it also uh, was very empowering for the, the, the people who are presenting their heritage because they, you know, it instills a bit of pride in them and it um, um, makes them feel like their, their heritage is important too and, and that it does have a relevance and that it has had a, an impact on this European heritage as well. So I think that it, it you know, we, we can think of heritage as being this um, old thing, this dusty thing, but actually it's very much about today and, and how we live today. And it informs so much of um, our attitudes and, and how we deal with things. So but that it also sounds like a, that project, particularly, it sounds like a very sustainable way to approach heritage, which is let's look at preserving important stories, let's look at building communities and fostering these dialogues, but also let's create employment and let's create opportunities because ultimately yeah. we need to kind of continue the cycle of opportunity. Um, and like it was one of those things I was interested just kind of on that sentiment. Um, I, I was interested, I was reading the um, kind of the annual update that I think it was your president or your director, I might just get the terminology wrong, mm -hmm. had put out earlier this year talking about naming the opportunities as well as the challenges that the pandemic has provided and one thing that it said was that you know in terms of enabling the European Union a kind of I guess the world more generally to recover from this experience 
we do have an opportunity to promote, pr or promote more kind of innovative and sustainable ways of looking at tourism. And I, I know it's something that kind of it, it, we in the museum sector would talk about, but, you know, sustainable tourism, what does that look like as you as an organization see it? Yeah, I think um, we yeah, have sustainable tourism is obviously it's a uh... So we can kind of start by, by talking about the threats, of course, which are perhaps obvious because it's also this, uh, this question of authenticity as well. So if you're going to a, a place like Venice and it's, you know, full of tourists, <laughs> it doesn't maybe feel like it, it loses its meaning a little bit, you know, because people, for instance, can't live in the, the city center anymore. So there are less people, less locals there. and then once those people leave then you lose a little bit of that authenticity and that meaning um, and then of course there's also the issue with you know the actual physical pressure on on uh, of tourists on uh, an area so um last year we also had a, an interesting project and um, which was awarded which was um uh, something to monitor a very um, famous uh, city, Avila in Spain, um, which is a heritage city. And it was also talking about the, the actual physical demands on, on the, the heritage. So sustainable tourism, yeah, it's uh, something that we're also trying to, to promote. And um, there's actually also a, a, another award scheme that we are also involved with. Um, so there is the European Cultural Tourism Network, and we also are uh, involved with an award scheme with them. So this is also something that we're trying to, to, um, to help and to, to promote. But sustainable tourism is very much about also going to places which are not... Uh, <laughs> as visited as often. Uh, so you're talking about also trying to create um, a cultural offer. So what's interesting as well is that tourists actually don't want to go to places where, well, I'm speaking on very broad terms now, but um, there is research to say that tourists prefer to go to places where there is a proper cultural offer and where this is sustainably upheld. So. Again, I'm always talking in terms of uh, award winners, <laughs> but um, last year we also had a very interesting project. So it's a Croatian island and obviously um, Croatia has a, a lot of pressure um, from tourism in places like Dubrovnik and Split. Um, and this was a, a small island which was receiving less uh, tourists and through the uh, renovation of a building there over a very long period of time they eventually were able to um, create a, a very strong cultural program of events and this actually did help to um, build back tourism a little bit and then there's a also another one of, which was a museum a shipbuilding museum uh, also on an island and they you know they they also they're creating this cultural offer so I think that yeah, it, it, it shows as well that investment in these types of areas and in, in small museums and small cultural centers that actually is really worth it. And it, it makes such a, a huge difference and contributes to this idea of sustainable tourism. Um, that's not going to the same places all of the time. <laughs> and it, do, it does kind of, it is the reality that the better ways or the, 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 the more successfully that we as kind of guest receiving destinations promote the variety of offerings and the ways to get people to explore different parts of your countries it just it does it's better for local communities and local economies but it's also better for the guest if you're having more authentic honest honest experience meeting the locals as opposed to yeah um, exactly yeah this is exactly it <laughs> yeah um it's one of those things that it's like you mentioned the um you mentioned the kind of the funding realities of investing into projects like this or kind of in, investing into culture and heritage projects and i think you know different funding models will be seen across europe and it's you know i'm always particularly interested to look at different case studies and the ways that different projects are made possible like kind of form and key as you mentioned with civic trust being a particularly interesting kind of sustainable business model but like one thing that 
I always find curious and that I'm really interested in from like with my little museum hat on is how we measure impact and demonstrate value. And, you know, it's inherently difficult to do when we're talking about measuring feelings, emotions, responses, and, you know, things that are maybe not as easy to put a Euro sign on as cold, hard metrics. And um, like, how do you as an organization look at that challenge of measuring value or measuring impact? Yeah, um, that can be difficult as well for us because obviously um, we're thinking in broader European terms. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to say, but I think that we are also, we're trying to look again at this sort of national nationally as well to see what's going on nationally and then yeah try to to get a sense of that and then also you know we are also working with the the EU institutions um so we can also look at their research as well and and kind of uh, gauge from there and we also have a lot of um university links as well so and um, we also have that expertise that we are very lucky to be able to rely on like we have a very strong network uh, all over Europe and so um I think from them as well we 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 gather those that that sense of as you said these not the the cold hard um, facts but of, of financing and money and things like that but also about these different trends that are going on around Europe and yeah I think that that's uh that, that's uh, hmm. It's funny though, it comes back to this idea of ultimately what you're talking about is community. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, and, and trying to, I mean, that's the other thing that um, so much of Europa Nostra's work is really about this network and, and feeding this network and trying to create these links. And, you know, it's, it's not just um, us sitting in our office and, and, and working. We also have a a huge network and we're trying to create synergies and um yeah work together with other organizations and with other experts to to come to the best yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's something that I really must commend you for because it is something that you know the little museum like we first like we were formally involved with yourselves you know gosh half decade almost ago at this stage and um, when we won the award but even now I do still feel like we are being treated as if we're part of the fold and really kind of involved and included and it is a lovely it's a, oh, well it's, that's great to hear <laughs> that's uh, our our intention so that's good and <laughs> um, and then I just in terms of something that I know nothing about and I'm therefore very curious and um, I was reading online about um Lucidaire, which is oh, a yeah, yeah. new project. Tell me all about it. Yeah, Lucidaire. So it's um it's a, a Horizon 2020 project. Um and uh, it's led by the Catholic University in Leuven, but there are eight partners of which Europa Nostra is one of them. So um it's a really incredible uh, partnership of of experts of experts from all over Europe. Um and what they are trying to do is they're trying to create a, a network of um, heritage practitioners and what it is really thinking about and what it is working towards is talking about how cultural heritage is, as I said before, a, a driver for international relations and for innovation and not just in the field of cultural heritage, but also outside of it. So, um, for now they yeah so they're they're creating this network of of heritage practitioners but they're also doing lots of other activities so and um, the next one that's coming up is going to be in Krakow so there is the um international uh cultural center I think that's I'm probably I'm um, fudging the title there but um they're one of the the um the partners of the project and they're hosting an event and it's for uh, kind of emerging professionals um, and it will be asking them about sort of this innovation aspects um, and then there are also some co-create they call them co-creation um, ateliers but um, 
they are also super interesting. So it's not just happening in Europe either. It's very much an international um, project. Um, so for instance, one of the recent co-creation um, uh, workshops that went on was uh, in uh, Peru, I, in Peru, I think. And uh, it was also asking farmers what they need and uh, kind of linking it to the cultural heritage and uh, coming up with solutions for regenerating an area. So it's, a, it's an extremely interesting um, project. Um, and I really encourage uh, people to go to their website to, to read more about it. It's extremely convincing as well. I think if you want to know about the value of cultural heritage, it's uh, extremely convincing. And then uh, Europa Nostra's role in it, well, part of it is that we also are awarding um, the Elucidari Special Prizes within our award scheme. Um, it will only be for two years uh, for now, but uh, we've had our, our last winners were last year, and then uh, this year we will have two more winners. Um, and again, they've, they've been uh, really amazing uh, examples. Um, so last year we had a, a project um, from Italy and Lebanon. So they were linking uh, school children in Italy and Lebanon, uh, just using uh, like Skype, I think. Um, but they were also having this sort of cultural exchange that was very much based in cultural heritage and the archaeology in their uh, in their towns and their regions. And so it was um, for many of them their first sort of experience of having this international exchange and it was very interesting. And so another part of what the Illustari Special Prizes are doing is, again, it's not just winning an award. It's also the idea is that they're going to help sort of bring the project to the next level. So for instance, with that project, um, the, the, with the school children in Italy and Lebanon, they're now extending that project to other countries and they are going to have more kids involved in it and more exchanges. And so it's really uh, this tangible result. And yeah. That is tangible. It sounds like a gorgeous project and it's funny yeah. I think you know it's it's today's equivalent of a pen pal uh, it's yeah. lovely to see how kind of time is advancing and um like one question that we talk about in the little museum from a history perspective I'd kind of be curious of your how you approach it from a heritage perspective and um, like one of the things that we think about and talk about is say if there's kind of a key referendum or an election or there's a key moment happening in kind of Dublin history or Irish history we kind of sometimes face that tension of at what point is it current affairs and at what point is it history like where do we step in and at what point do we have a role to play and um, it, it, it's led to really some genuinely fascinating just conversations over the years but I kind of wonder how do you approach that because not only do you need to decide where the scope of the heritage that your awards are recognizing sits but also where the public willingness to perceive an event or a piece of tangible or intangible heritage as heritage like yeah yeah this question <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's a really good question, and I think that um, yeah, like it's it's so difficult. <laughs> it's uh, because this idea of also contested heritage, it's very much a um, it's a very much a, a real thing, and it's in it's a whole field of study within itself, of course. But of course, like thinking about when is heritage and when is when does it actually become heritage? When is it just something that's a little bit older? Um, this, yeah, this is also something that I think differs across Europe as well. So um, <laughs> maybe I can just speak on a personal level, but when I go to um, countries that are maybe more to the east of Europe. And when I see this, um, for instance, architecture from the 80s or this more brutalist architecture, I think a lot of people there are thinking like, why are you, why are you even looking at that? Like, well, that's not interesting at all. And I'm like, wow, it's so interesting. When you see like the, the mix of all of the different um, architecture, like that's so interesting. And 
yeah, this is, these are attitudes that can differ. And um, I don't think that any of us can prescribe it. I think this is also the, the idea. So when we get um, an application for the awards, we don't, we also don't judge it. I mean, the, the jury is doing that and the jury is also changing. Um, you know, all the time. I mean, new members are coming in and others, their mandates are, are ending. So yeah, it's it's a very tough, <laughs> tough area to, to try and, and think about that, but um, it's always interesting. And um, this is also a little bit why we are now considering the awards and, and considering what we might be leaving out. So it's, it's tough. I mean, we're we're now having some discussions behind the scenes to kind of decide. I mean, how how do we do we go ahead with that? But it, it is it is interesting because I know, for instance, there's also quite a movement in in Europe. I mean, it's not very maybe visible, but um, this whole issue of animals and uh, animals that are indigenous to landscapes and how they. Uh, contribute actually to your enjoyment of a cultural landscape. I mean, here in the Netherlands, uh, this is a really big thing. They're introducing these uh, breeds of cows into uh, landscapes and national in natural parks because it's beautiful and it's considered traditionally Dutch. And I think there's similar things going on in Ireland as well. Um, uh, and I mean, do we consider that heritage? And can we can we at Europe and Austria and the European Commission can we start judging that do we have the expertise to do that it's always difficult um but I think that's also what's exciting about heritage is that it's always throwing you something new and that you have to think all the time <laughs> yeah gosh I'd say the uh, the scope of the, the scope of the work if you allow it to be is you know you kind of even just you know the built landscapes and the environments that we have here across Ireland you kind of you know, I think having all of us who spent the last year kind of getting outdoors and exploring the uh, the home environment and you just realize the value of some of the assets that we have really and truly on our doorstep um, and it, it's interesting to hear the kind of the take on the kind of the animals and kind of the yeah. preservation piece there because I think then there's kind of a wider sustainability conversation which exactly. is you know, yeah 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 something that we're yeah. all yeah, and you think about, well, like, yeah, how much can you interfere? And yeah, it's a, uh, it is, it's fascinating, but um, I'm sure that, yeah, on the, it's the kind of like a, a, on a smaller level when you're in a museum and you're trying to make those decisions as well, it must be extremely difficult, I'm sure. But I'm sure in, in some cases, it's been extremely obvious also for you and for it, it, it makes a friend. <laughs> it makes for a fun discussion, let's put it that way. But yeah. Uh, and then just kind of, I, I guess, kind of going from animals and landscapes, it kind of very naturally leads me to ask about something you mentioned earlier on. Um, the most endangered program, um, like, first of all, it's wonderful to see a platform as kind of notable and respected as yourselves being used to actually advocate for heritage rather than simply kind of commending projects for what they are achieving. Um, like, Tell me a little bit about that. Like I know, um, was it there was a metro line recently that you were quite vocal in kind of speaking about the needs to protect local heritage? Yeah, this was a, a specific uh, case. I think you're referring to Greek, the, the Greek one. Yeah, so this is also something that we're doing. We're trying to also advocate. So if we I mean, plenty of times if you go onto the website as well, you can see some of our advocacy that's uh, going towards that, towards uh, writing letters and trying to give uh, advice in that sense. Um, but the Seven Most Endangered uh, program, it is interesting because it's also grown quite a lot. So um, it used to be every two years, but now it's uh, going to be every year. We now have um, a new colleague who's uh, taking care of that and she's doing a great job. Um, but the, really the, the aim of the seven most endangered, and I think um, it's really to, to draw attention and to, to try and help. So it isn't, you know, um, a list of, uh, of things that have gone wrong or, or, or something like that, or it's not a list of, you know, this is 
this is being handled badly. It's not that at all. It's really uh, working with uh, the nominators. So people have to nominate um, their own sites. Um, and then we, um, again, have a ne this network of um, experts who will come together and they will actually go to the site if possible. And then uh, they will provide most of the time a report on what they think the, the main issues are there and um, how they think it could be solved or what, what the next step could be. Um, and you know, it also is very useful because uh, sometimes when you have people who are coming from outside, it sort of takes away as well, perhaps if there might be some tensions there or something like that, it's always good to have a, a sort of an outside voice come in and you know that doesn't have uh, some vested interest or anything like that. So there's also a little bit of that of bringing all of the stakeholders together as much as possible mm -hmm. to sort of discuss it and to 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 try and come to uh, an agreement on things. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of uh, really nice uh, results from that as well. Um, uh, there is, for instance, in Mafra in Portugal, there was uh, some. Um, a, a Carillion that was at risk of, uh, well, plenty of risks, <laughs> but basically it was a, in bad need of restoration. Um, and, you know, within a few years as well, uh, and partly from the contributions of the, the seven most endangered, they are now beautifully restored and they're, they're ringing again. So it's this nice story. And of course, each of them have different challenges and some of them are very difficult to, to overcome, but sometimes, you know, a little bit of um, intervention can help. And there has been as well in the past, there's a, some sometimes funds available as well. And we've seen as well that if you go to a, um, a smaller country or, um, yeah, or, or just a smaller project, a smaller locality, sometimes that small bit of uh, seed money makes all the difference and it kind of gets things rolling. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a great, great program and it's um, it is doing great work. Uh, but it's again, it's very interesting because you really see that there are many uh, issues facing heritage all over Europe and they all differ so much. And the, the differences in the locality make all the difference as well. So. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it therefore shows that there is unique, isolated value to each individual place that needs to be kind of recognized and preserved or kind of protected in its own unique set of circumstances. Um, exactly. Yeah. One thing I saw online that I want to go back and spend a little bit of time reading up on um, was that I saw that you co-facilitated a workshop which was called re re uh, rediscovering the sense of a place I think this was part of the European Bauhaus conference um, and it, it kind of it got me thinking and I'm wondering I don't know if it's too early if research has really been done on this yet but do we have any sense of how the pandemic might have impacted civic engagement or kind of a wider sense of place that kind of citizens feel to the location that they live in or ideally call home? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that's an interesting question. And I think that, yeah, it will take us maybe some more time to, to know, um, to know the, the greater effects. But yeah, I think in the sense of place, I think that people are discovering their localities more. And they're also, um, I guess, there's been for many people a sense of a little bit of freedom <laughs> from the from the pandemic and I don't want to talk about it as if it's been this positive thing that's happened to us but I think that people are maybe paying a little bit more of attention to their surroundings so yeah I, I'm not sure I don't want to <laughs> say anything for sure but um, I think that it could be uh, it will have a fascinating effect and I'm sure that those effects will be felt for a very long time and um, yeah yeah so in the sense of uh, belonging in the sense of place I think that yeah this is this is what I can say for now is that it's sort of uh, yeah creating maybe a little bit more awareness and also people are feeling this you know, if you're stuck inside, maybe you you want uh, things. I mean, the new, the new European Bauhaus as well, what's interesting about it is that 
they talk about beauty and they talk about the aesthetic value of things. So I think that people are also, yeah, I think it's something that's maybe obvious, but actually it has a really big effect on us. And I think that heritage has, has also got a part to play in that because heritage buildings tend to be quite beautiful. And I think that uh, they, yeah, they add a lot to, to our surroundings. So, and yeah. I guess kind of when we talk with the environmental piece as well, like, you know, it's, I know myself that the, uh, the day my five kilometer radius was lifted, the first thing I did was drove and got as close to trees as humanly possible. That yeah. Was objective number one. Um, yeah, yeah, I was the same. <laughs> yeah. I, I see a question coming in. Um, I, one of our guests is wondering, what is the funding model that runs the Europa Nostra as an organization? Yeah, so as I said, we are an NGO. So um, we have a diverse um, range of funding. Um, the European Heritage Awards, Europa Nostra Awards, is uh, funded um, almost entirely by the, the European Commission um, because it is their, their program as well, or a lot of the, the funding is coming from them. Um, but then we also have um, donors, of course. We also have our members who we um, really value and we also um, um, have, have money coming in from there. Um, and then, you know, we're also... Um, we also have some other projects as well, which are also uh, coming partly funded by the EU as well. So they will be network projects, for example. Um, and they're also, yeah, uh, coming from EU funding. And then we also have, for instance, for, for smaller projects, we might get money from foundations or things like that. So it's coming from a lot of different uh, sources. Um, so it really depends on the project and the activity where, where it's coming from. but. Yeah, if it, it's a good question. And uh, what's interesting about the, the funding is that it is always a question. And we've noticed, we asked um, actually last year during the pandemic, what people want to learn about and what they, um, what would be helpful. So we were trying to kind of offer uh, resources as much as we could. And one of the things uh, that came up quite often was financing and funding. So I think that yeah, it's it's a uh, especially in this field, it's always an issue and it's always a challenge. So, yeah. um, if there's any particular questions about how we do things, you can always get in touch with me. But um, yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends on the project and the activity. That's what I would say. Yeah, I, I would dare say that um, the past year has really shown, I, I guess, kind of cultural projects and heritage projects that you know putting all your eggs in one basket is a very Kind of scary situation to find yourself in yeah. so that kind of that diversified model that you're talking about there yeah. what i should say i just realized i didn't say it is from the creative europe program especially because i should mention uh, very specifically the, the, the funding so creative europe program of course is the european union's um project or program that is uh, especially funding the audiovisual and cultural sector and um yeah they they have provided a lot of money and uh, it was just renewed uh, just last year or this year I should say um, and with even more money so this is good news of course for for us <laughs> for, for all cultural heritage practitioners of course that's what I mean yeah the, the yeah. scale of the impact is kind of well kind of I guess recognized and like one thing I kind of one thing I found myself thinking about in preparation for this evening was school and you know it's I, I would say a lot of people who are joining us now this evening you know perhaps may remember and I, I don't know well this is my own personal experience that you know within our Irish school curriculum your role as an Irish person your role as a Dubliner was something that was talked about when looking at history and key events but we were also i in my well my own experience we're made very aware of our european identity yeah and i kind of i guess i was wondering do we have a sense of how the irish experience as a european differs or is kind of benchmarked against other countries yeah yeah i i always find this really interesting because um i'm the same i i when I think about my my school, my time in school, I remember it as being that we talked a lot about the benefits of what we were getting from 
the EU. And um, yeah, since this uh, came up for me as well, I was sort of looking into it a little bit and of this Irish attitude, let's say, towards the EU. And I think that it's, it's yeah, it's generally, I've always had this impression that it's quite positive and that uh, we've been told of how positive it is. And of course, it's nuanced because, you know, it's not always that it's been this great relationship or, or that it's, it's perfect is what I mean, not that it hasn't been great, but um, that it's, it's perfect. But I, I really do think that it's, it's down to the education in, in our schools. I think the curriculum always uh, kind of, um, yeah, educated us about it and what those benefits were and what our, our role in it was. And I think also maybe in the first 20 years or so of, of Ireland being in the EU, it was a little bit different. We always sort of maybe saw ourselves as this sort of peripheral country and then we were small and we didn't really have a big role to play. But I think that that's changing. And I think as well, yeah, with events of the past five years or so, <laughs> which we can, we can all attribute, we know what we're talking about, but I think that this also has maybe, you know, made us think about it a little bit more um, and has also revealed that maybe in other countries it's not as it's not as openly talked about and it's not um it's not a, a a standard part of the curriculum maybe I mean I was always uh, surprised like about that I mean being Irish and being in a, a, another European country and you meet people from all over all the time and I was kind of surprised when they wouldn't know about these things uh yeah I, I found it uh interesting so I mean I, I always had this uh, very pro-European outlook I always kind of wanted to come to Europe and I always kind of saw myself here and I don't know if I ever planned to to be in the Netherlands for going on seven years but <laughs> I think I it, it's not uh, it's not a surprise to me so yeah I think uh yeah I think I can say that it's it's down to the the way we we learn about it in school I think Mm. So it's, it's that little bit more positive, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's showcasing the importance of bringing history into our curriculums and really giving it the time and the space for young children to actually kind of, you know, better understand where they're coming from in the kind of wider journey towards wherever their future is leading them. Um, and then I guess kind of just to kind of coming up on the hour to kind of end on that thought, um, like, when your open nostra looks to the future of heritage europe kind of you know the uh, i guess the next chapter what are the what's the hope or what are the key themes that the europe nostra really are looking towards as we look into the next chapter yeah so um europe nostra has a lot of uh, different uh, focuses and I think that at the moment, um, something that is pressing for everybody and that we are aware of now and that we're also really working on is the, the what we call the, the Heritage Green New Deal. So, um, of course, we, you know, the, the Green New Deal is being talked about more and more for, for Europe and, and we're moving towards sort of uh, defining what that will look like for us as well. Um, but we really are hoping that cultural heritage has a big part to play in that. And we're really convinced that it does have a, a big part to play in it. And um, I think that, yeah, I think that this is a, a very big focus um, for us and, and for the future. And then also you mentioned it as well, the, the new European Bauhaus, this is another um, focus for us as well. And um, in terms of the awards, like we well, really think again that it's, this wonderful um, bank of, of best practices. And so, you know, naturally enough, the, the trends and, and the awards have gone in that direction, but we really want to, in the future, I think, um, lean into that even more and to, to, to really show that, that these are very uh, concrete examples of how, how it is relevant and how it has a lot of the answers to, to many of the issues that we're facing now. Um, so I think that this is these are more or less the, the the issues and also you know again bringing it back we talked a lot about people and I think that um, yeah using heritage to to include people I mean 
this is something that we're also aware of now as well, these inequalities. And um, I think that cultural heritage and, and cultural practice has a lot to, mm. to um, yeah, to contribute in that sense. So I, I can only hope that um, we're doing a good enough job that we convince the, the right people, of course, <laughs> to, to make those changes as well at a at policy level. But I think that there are very receptive people everywhere. And that, yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I hope. They, and I, I think that the good thing about Europe and Austria is that we are a very hopeful and very positive um, organization. Uh, so every time we're talking about problems, we generally are, are also talking about the solutions, which I think is really important. So. I do think that sense of hope really has come across and kind of, you know, choosing optimism over the alternative is something that's really come across over the course of this conversation. And I think a greener, more sustainable, more inclusive, more people focused future really sounds quite all right. All things considered. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful? <laughs> Keep doing the work. Um, yeah. but no, and I think it's kind of it's important to say, just kind of in drawing this conversation to the close, the impact that the Europe in Austria had on the little museum when we were yeah. still arguably kind of emerging out of startup mode really was quite important in kind of invalidating the work and the efforts that we were doing. And we'll always be grateful to that. And um, you know, it is again with ourselves yeah. yourselves it's all about the people but um kind of on that note we've just uh, passed the hour so um yeah. to everyone who's been with us sincerely thank you so much for taking the time our guest this evening has been Audrey Hogan the program officer from Europe and Austria the European Heritage Awards um Audrey thank you so so much for taking the time I really appreciate it yeah thank you so much for having me it's been a real pleasure <laughs> Sure, we'll see you all soon. And that's it for another 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum. So good evening. Take care. Bye-bye.